Testing. 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 Test testing. All right. Welcome to another Hoopo stream. Uh, I did a little switcheroo yesterday. So originally we were going to read a segmentation paper, kind of a continuation of the segment anything. But uh, just last night, or I don't know if it was last night, but yesterday they released uh, Meta AI Research released Dino V2, uh, which seems more important than uh, the paper I was going to read, so I switched and we're now going to read Dino V2. Uh, released basically uh, this week. I don't know why it says 14, because I saw it for the first time on uh, Twitter yesterday, recommended by a friend. So this is version two of uh, Dino, which is a unsupervised method for training kind of foundational computer vision models, if you can call it that. I think computer vision is getting to the point where uh, these things can be called foundational models, right? We're no longer in the world of segmentation models and classification models and bounding box detection models. And I think that world of having specialized architectures for the different parts is slowly disappearing into the mist of time. And more and more, we're seeing kind of these big, giant, uh, multitask computer vision problem or computer vision models that uh, you can apply to a huge variety of tasks. And this is the uh, GitHub, by the way. And if you look here, right, the backbones that they train are all vision transformers. So we're kind of seeing the supremacy of vision transformers, right? You don't really see a lot of uh, convnets as encoders anymore but these are big, right? You got big, big vision transformers that are supposed to be task agnostic. So look at this. You can even load them directly from Python. This is quite, quite good. They got the conda environment, little requirements. Yeah, and the problem, maybe the one negative of this is if you look at this, right, these like training uh, runs that they run, they're running on 12 A100s. Like this is, you know, like I feel like the previous generation of computer vision models, you could kind of maybe train them at home or at least maybe fine tune them at home. But nowadays these things are just so huge. You can't, you can't, you can't even run these, you know? But it's good, you know, we're kind of moving forward and we're seeing the beginnings of foundational models for computer vision. Or not the beginnings, but kind of the supremacy of them. So let's get going here. So as we see these foundation models become the norm in the machine learning world, this is something that you're seeing all the time as well, right? It's gone are the days where a paper just has three to four names on it, right? Nowadays, the machine learning papers have 20 names on them because there's a whole squad of people, a whole team of people that are required to train at these giant foundation models. So maybe we're gonna see a change in just the way machine learning research works. And rather than reading uh, 10 papers that are each kind of like largely spearheaded by one person and there's maybe like a handful of people on the thing, you're gonna be reading machine learning papers uh, with 20 names on them right which is kind of what we're seeing um so let's get started here recent breakthroughs in natural language processing for model pre-training on large quantities have opened the way for similar foundation models in computer vision yeah that's kind of the key word there these models could greatly simplify the use of images in any system by producing all-purpose visual features right you want to have an encoder that give it an image and it'll give you a feature vector, an embedding that is useful for any task you could want. Segmentation, classification, bounding box detection, potentially some kind of weird regression. Uh, features that work across image distributions and tasks without fine tuning. 
You, know, you don't wanna, you don't need to push any gradients into this giant encoder. This work shows that existing pre-training methods, especially self-supervised methods, can produce such features if trained on enough curated data from diverse sources. So curated data from diverse sources, right? The word curated there is a little bit interesting, right? That means they're doing a lot of data cleaning, a lot of data prep, and this is something we saw out of OpenAI as well, right? Where they actually have a whole team of people internally that clean the text data, right? So if cleaning the text data is important, I think cleaning the image data is even more important because the distribution of kind of image data is, I don't, I don't know if I want to say broader and more varied than text data, but I would, I would kind of make that statement. Uh, we revisit existing approaches, combine different techniques, and scale our pre-training in terms of data on model and size. So maybe one interesting thing here is that OpenAI is not going to tell us about all the different tricks and uh, techniques that they use for pre-training and training their large foundation models because they're so afraid of competitors that they don't want to release that, but Meta is not afraid, right? And whatever techniques they use here uh, for training these large models on huge, uh, these huge parallel setups of like multi-GPUs in these server racks, those are probably very, very similar to the techniques that OpenAI is using to train their LLMs, right? There's probably the same kind of tricks. So looking at these type of papers where they're training these vision foundation models might be a way to kind of intuit what OpenAI is doing when they're training their uh, text foundation models. So a little tip there. Uh, technical contributions aim at accelerating and stabilizing the training at scale, right? Lots of different types of regularization, maybe uh, evaluation kind of like weaved in there. We propose an automatic pipeline to build a dedicated, diverse, and curated image data set instead of uncurated data, as typically done in the self-supervised literature. The curation is important. In terms of the models, we train a VIT model with 1 billion parameters. This is a huge vision transformer. This is no joke. Like, you probably can't even fit this on your consumer GPU. And distill it into a series of smaller models, right? So this is kind of interesting. I feel like maybe previously what you would have seen is that they would have trained multiple smaller or multiple models of, of different sizes, but now kind of distillation has gotten to the point where it's pretty good and there's a good set of tricks associated with model distillation. Model distillation is where you take a larger model and then you train a smaller model to basically mimic the bigger model, right? You give something to the bigger model, the bigger model produces an output, and then you say, okay, small model here is the input to the big model and the output to the big model, just copy that, right? So if you're trying to save on a bunch of training and compute budget, this actually seems like a very good technique, right? Train the very, very big model with your huge data set, with all your tricks, all the like kind of regularization, all that stuff, and then take that big model and then from it, distill a bunch of smaller models which is actually probably much more common than we think it is. I think probably OpenAI does this as well, right? I bet you that whenever you're using ChatGPT, right, you're not actually using the large ChatGPT model. You're using some kind of distilled model that has been uh, kind of chosen to fit exactly into whatever one inference GPU that like is, designed for uh, user requests, right? Because the 1 billion parameter model is just, that's gonna be too huge. You, having that in a, in a kind of like a model serving context where people can like send uh, requests to that model, it's, you, it'd be very complicated to have that available. But these little tiny models that you can fit on one GPU, right, that's a lot easier to do. Open clip. Uh oh, is this the end of clip? No, because this isn't text, right? Learning task agnostic pre-trained representations have become the standard in natural language processing. One can use these features as they are, i.e. without fine tuning. This is key here, right? 
and achieve performance on downstream tasks that are significantly better than those produced by task-specific models. This success has been fueled by pre-training on large quantities of raw text using pretext objectives, such as language modeling or word vectors that require no supervision. And the word raw here is kind of misleading, right? I think part of what they're going to talk about in this paper, and I think it's going to be a huge theme, is the curation, right? Where you can just train on huge raw data sets that you just scraped off the internet, but you the quality of that of those images is just not going to be good enough, and you, you want to curate that data set. So I suspect that a huge section of this is going to be the curation. Uh, following this paradigm shift, we expect similar foundation models to appear in computer vision. These models should generate visual features that work on the box, work out of the box on any task. Uh, most promising efforts towards these foundational models focus on text-guided pre-training. So this is what Clip does, right? Clip has uh, both text and image features are being projected into the same kind of embedding space. But it doesn't seem like that's what they're going to be doing here. I think this is an image-only uh, model. This form of text-guided pre-training limits the information that can be retained about the image since captions only approximate the rich information in images and complex pixel-level information may not surface with this supervision. Hmm. This is kind of interesting. They're saying that there's some limit to... Uh, text and image modalities. If you train on both text and image, which is what Clip does, they're saying that you're going to lose out on some of the signal that you're going to get, right? Specifically this pixel level information. That's kind of cool, right? I feel like that's also contrarian, right? Most people would say that, hey, if you have text and image, it's better to train on both modalities and the features you get out of that are going to be more rich. But here you have people saying that, no, the text is just a distraction. You're better off just training purely on the image. We compute a PCA. PCA is a principal component analysis. It's a kind of, it's a form of dimensionality reduction. Uh, I would call it like a classic machine learning algorithm. And it's a way to take kind of like a high dimensional uh, vector space, I guess, and compress it into usually three dimensions so that you can visualize it. So uh, here we go. So if you have some data set like this, right, you can identify the principal component, right? And the principal components are going to be defined by the some kind of dimension in which you have high variance or low variance, right? So here, this kind of smear of data, right, you can say, okay, well, the most variance exists kind of along this axis and then this axis. So these two must be the, the two principal components of it, right? And you can, you're not limited to like two dimensions or three dimensions. You can kind of do it in any amount of dimensions. Uh, show the first three components. Each component is matched to a different color channel. Same parts are matched between related images despite changes of pose, style, or even objects. Huh. So this is actually really cool. So when you look at this, it kind of looks like some kind of segmentation, right? Like a pose detector model, right? Like these uh, pose nets, dense pose, right? This is like work that people did for a while where it's like it basically segments out the head and the body and the legs as different parts. But the interesting thing here is that this isn't that, right? This is just PCA on the features, right? You They fed these images into their giant image encoder, they get a vector of features, they do PCA on those features, and then it turns out that the representation of the elephant head is the same kind of thing as the eagle's wings, right? And or, I guess not here. Here they're showing you that all four of these elephants, right, which one of them isn't even a picture of an elephant, it's like a picture of a statue of an elephant, the head of the elephant is the same, right? You see this green color on all of it. So it's almost like it's implicitly learned this notion of different parts of the animal, which is kind of fucking crazy. Actually, look at here. This one's even more impressive, right? Look at this. There's this, this is like an overhead shot of a bunch of horses on a field, and each of them is has the same exact kind of uh, coloring as the individual pictures of horses, which is crazy, right? Because these are so tiny. So it can understand scale quite well as well.
That's cool. Uh, an alternative to text-guided pre-training is self-supervised learning, uh, where features are learned from images alone. These approaches are conceptually closer to pretext tasks such as language modeling and can capture information at the image and pixel level. However, despite their potential to learn all-purpose features, most of these advances in self-supervised learning were made in the context of pre-training on small curated datasets, ImageNet 1K, right, ImageNet, good old ImageNet 1K, right, and the 1K there refers to 1,000 uh, classes. It's a classification model. Some efforts on scaling these approaches have been attempted, but they focused on uncurated data sets, which typically lead to a significant drop in quality, right? Uncurated, significant drop in quality. This is explained by the lack of control over the data quality and diversity, which are essential to produce good features. I agree with this, but I also think that this is a phase, right? I think that we're currently in a phase where training on a very, very large curated data set is better than training on a slightly larger uncurated data set. But I feel like the, the Rich Sutton kind of bitter lesson is going to come back. And what we're going to see is that I feel like in the future, the most, the biggest possible uncurated data set is actually going to be the best way to do it. So I think this curating the data sets is working right now for this particular uh, generation of foundation models, but I suspect that in the future, the scale will just beat out. And maybe there's some ways that you could basically weigh, you could like take the image and then figure out whether it's a high quality image or a low quality image with the model itself, and then basically do some kind of like pseudo labeling in that way. Explore if self-supervised learning has the potential to learn all-purpose visual features. If pre-trained a large quality, we revisit existing discriminative self-supervised approaches, okay, that uh, learn features at both the image and patch level, both the image and patch level. So these are vision transformers, right? So they cut up the image into these little patches. We reconsider some of the design choices under the lens of a larger data set. Most of our technical contributions are tailored towards stabilizing and accelerating discriminative self-supervised learning. So basically it's all these bags of tricks that you use whenever you're training these huge models. So here are some numbers here, two times faster and three times less memory, which is huge. And larger batch sizes. This is key. So. A uh, very old paper at this point, but a paper that is definitely a seminal work in machine learning is the don't decrease the learning rate, increase the batch size. And basically what they describe in this paper is that larger batch sizes are just inherently better, right? Because the bigger the batch size, the more kind of stable the gradient or the kind of direction is, right? Like if you just have a couple images, if you have a small batch size, then the direction you take in that gradient step that results from that batch can be kind of noisy, right? And you can end up taking kind of steps that kind of move around for no, like there's a lot of noise in them, right? But if you have a very large batch, the average kind of, of the direction that you end up getting when you take a gradient step from that large batch is more in line with the entire data set, right? So you kind of end up taking it like a straighter line through this loss landscape. Regarding pre-training data, we have built an automatic pipeline to filter and rebalance data sets. So this is similar to what we saw in the segment anything paper where basically they have this human in the loop kind of like semi-automatic pipeline where it kind of like initially the humans are labeling and then the system labels more and more and then the humans are just kind of like uh, confirming and uh, checking to make sure that the system is labeling correctly. Data similarities are used instead of external metadata and do not require manual annotation. A major difficulty when dealing with images is to rebalance concepts and avoid overfitting on a few dominant modes. Okay, interesting. So you have this kind of mode collapse potentially where there's specific kind of solutions that the uh, neural net can end up in that are like kind of good for solving the thing but are just mostly at local minima or local maxima depending on what you want to measure 
gathered a small but diverse corpus of 142 million images. Just just a little small data set, you know, just uh, 142 million images, just casual. We provide a variety of pre-trained visual models called Dino V2, trained with different vision transformers, architectures on our data. We released all the models. You know, OpenAI, like, they don't release shit, and then Meta here is releasing everything, so... Meta is more open than OpenAI, which is kind of weird to think about. We validate the quality of Dynode V2 on various computer vision benchmarks. So, of course, you're going to see some kind of ImageNet, potentially Coco. We conclude that self-supervised pre-training alone is a good candidate for learning transferable frozen features. So, frozen here and transferable. The idea here is that you don't want to uh, fine-tune the feature encoder. Sometimes when you take a pre-trained encoder, such as an ImageNet encoder, you don't actually you you don't want to freeze it, right? You you want to let some of your gradients flow through it because like that it becomes more adapted to your task. But we're moving into a world where these pre-trained encoders are just so powerful that if you push gradients into them, they're just going to become worse. So in that paradigm, you would basically never uh, freeze your uh, feature encoder, right? And the feature encoder is uh, this thing here, right? This giant backbone is another word to, that you can use to call it. That are competitive with the best openly available weekly supervised models. Competitive. So they didn't get state of the art, they got competitive. Intra-image self-supervised training. Okay, so here you have different related works. This paper is actually pretty long and I do have a hard out, so I'm probably gonna scroll through some of this. Overview of our data processing pipeline. Images from a curated and uncurated data source are first mapped to embeddings. Uncurated images are then deduplicated before matched to a curated images. The resulting combination augments the initial data set through a self-supervised retrieval system. Okay, so they have, uh, in these kind of like block diagrams, a lot of times the data, right, the database is like kind of like shown as a cylinder. So here they're showing you they have this giant database of uncurated data and curated data. And obviously the size here shows you that there's much more uncurated data than there is curated data. Then they take all of these images and they feed them through some uh, feature encoder, which is probably just gonna be a version of the feature encoder that they're using. And it'll give you an embedding, right? And you can use the similarity between those embeddings to compare the uh, different images, right? So the same way that people use vector databases to uh, store text in such a way that you can use similarity to compare uh, different parts of text, which is super hot in the LLM space right now. You can do the same kind of thing with images, right? You could, you could uh, embed all your images, and then you can use similarity between the um, embedded images in order to find similar images, which is what's going on here, right? Deduplication is basically just saying, hey, these two images have almost identical embeddings, therefore let's get rid of it. And retrieval here is the... Uh, idea of like, okay, let's go and give me images that are very, very similar in their embeddings to this image here, and that's what you get there. So this kind of self-supervised retrieval system where the system can go into the database, find the images that are most similar to the one that it currently has, and then maybe curate its own little mini batch that it trades on. The growing body of work is focused on scaling the abilities of self-supervised pre-training and model size. Automatic data curation. Okay, data processing. We assemble our curated LBD 142 mil data set. So this is the actual data set that they use. And again, like props to them for actually naming it, you know, and like make like telling you what they're training on. It's not just like a, hey, we trained on a data set, but we're not gonna even tell you what it is or how big it is or anything like that, right? They do tell you how big it is and they do tell you kind of how they got it. 
uh, images that are close to those in several curated data sets. We describe below the main component in our data pipeline, including the curated-uncurated data sources, the image deduplication step, and the retrieval system. So there's a couple different components up here. You have the curation and uncuration, you have deduplication, and then you have retrieval. Does not require any metadata or text, so they're not training a clip, right? They're not training something that has knowledge of both text and image. This is a pure image foundation model. Uh, is detailed in the appendix and contains ImageNet 22K, the train split of ImageNet 1K, Google Landmarks, and several fine-grained data sets. So this is the actual components of their LVD 142 mil. Uh, we collect a raw unfiltered data set from a publicly available repository of crawled image data. Okay. We extract URL links of images we discard URLs that are unsafe or restricted by domains and post-process the downloaded images, PCA hash deduplication, NSFW filtering, and blurring identifiable faces. I wonder how much they're missing out on, you know, like in these type of, like how much of all the images in the internet are like not safe for work, right? That's probably a lot. There's probably a huge chunk of of, of image data that they could be training on, right? So who is gonna be brave enough to train on all the porn data? That's the real question. We apply the copy detection pipeline of PISI to the uncurated data and recover, remove near duplicate images. So this is where they're doing the similarity of the embeddings. This reduces redundancy and increases diversity among images. We also remove near duplicates of images contained in the test or validation set of any benchmark used in this work. A lot of filtering going on here. We build our curated data set, curated pre-training data set by retrieving images from our uncurated data source that are close to the images in our curated sources. We first compute an image embedding using a self-supervised VITH network pre-trained on ImageNet 22K, and then use cosine similarity as a distance measure between these two images. So this is interesting. I thought that they would have basically, the way that they embedded these images, they would have used the model itself and then kind of constantly updated that model to get better and better and better embeddings. But it actually sounds like what they're using to create these embeddings for the retrieval and deduplication is actually just a pre-trained uh, vision encoder huge. So VI, the H here means huge, so it's a bigger one, right? There's different sizes. You have uh, VIT small, VIT base, VIT large, and then VIT huge. And the 16 here refers to the fact that this particular vision transformer cuts the image into 16 patches, right? So a four by four patch. And then uh, cosine similarity is a measure of similarity between two vectors, right? So it tells you how similar two vectors are. So two vectors that are basically like this, very high cosine similarity, two vectors that are like that, pointing in opposite directions, very low cosine similarity. Uh, given a query data set, if it is large enough to retrieve n, typically four nearest neighbors for each query image. If it is small, we sample m images from the cluster corresponding to each query image. We adjust n and m by visual inspection of the retrieval result. They probably have an internal vector database, right? Like this to me screams internal vector database. The deduplication and retrieval stages of our pipeline rely on the face library, fast AI search, image search, something like that, to efficiently index and compute batch searches of its nearest embeddings. Oh shit, I remember this, yeah. Yeah, this is like the internal Facebook similarity search. Written in C++ with complete wrappers for Python and NumPy. Someone needs to rewrite this in Rust. <laughs> Every time I see C++ now, I'm like, they should rewrite it in Rust, but I feel like Rust developers are like extremely hard to find because it takes a special type of person to learn Rust. 
Uh, we heavily leverage its support for GPU accelerated indices using inverted file indices with product quantization codes. Yeah, so these are all the different tricks you can use to basically make similarity search faster. The whole processing is distributed on a compute cluster of 20 nodes equipped with, <laughs> like, look at these monsters here. You have 20 nodes, right? And each node has eight V132 gigabyte GPUs. Like, holy shit, like, this is, these are monster systems, right? And, you know, I stand in awe of these kind of systems because they're very powerful, but I also, it makes me a little bit sad, right? Because... I feel like five years ago, you read a machine learning paper and, and they were like, oh, we trained this on like a, a GPU on our consumer hardware. And it, and it was amazing because you're like, oh shit, that means I can train that, right? But I feel like every single paper that I read now, it's like the hardware that they're using is just way beyond everything. How much do they cost each? Let's see. A V132 gigabyte. You know, this isn't as bad as the A100. This is like a $3,000 GPU, maybe $4,000 GPU. But there's eight of them, right? So it's $3,000 times eight, and then there's 20 nodes. So the total cost of that training rig is over, it's like basically half a million dollars. So this 20 node 8V132 is a half million dollar system. We learn our features with a discriminative self-supervised method that can be seen as a combination of dyno and iBot losses with the centering of SWAV. So here are the different level, different losses, right? And the, the losses, the loss for this is probably gonna be quite complicated. There's gonna be like 10 different uh, terms to it, right? They also have regularization here. Uh, high resolution training phrase. We rapidly introduce each of these approaches, but more details can be found in the related papers. Okay, so here are all these different tricks. Let's see. Image level objective. We consider the cross entropy loss between the features extracted from a student and a teacher network. So in a distillation framework, you have a teacher network, which is the big one, and then you have the student, which is the small network, the small model, the small neural net. Both features are coming from the class token of a VIT obtained from different crops of the same image. Okay, so they're cropping the different parts of the image and then feeding that into a vision encoder or a vision transformer, which then gives you visual tokens, right? And visual tokens is just another way to say an embedding for an image. We learn the parameters of the student and build a teacher with an exponential moving average of its past iterates. Right, so this we saw yesterday, right, the exponential moving average, this idea of having multiple different models that are all slightly different, and then you basically take the average of all their weights, and that becomes kind of the, the big model, right? This is uh, something that, we, that is much more of a thing in reinforcement learning because of the way that reinforcement learning works, and you have to kind of spread your model in order to gather experience, but the same kind of like... Uh, distributed training requirements are resulting in EMA being more and more popular for everything that isn't RL. We randomly mask some of the same input patches given the student but not the teacher. We then, so here's, it's kind of like a dropout kind of thing, right? So the vision transformer cuts the image into four by four patches, 16 of them, and you're gonna basically zero out some of them, right? So it's kind of like a dropout basically. We add a cross entropy loss between the patch features on both networks on each masked patch. This loss is combined with a image level loss. Untying head weights between both objectives. We observe that tying the weights associated with both objectives makes the model underfit at the patch level while overfitting at the image level. Untying these weights resolves this issue and improves the performance at both scales. Uh, okay, so underfitting at the patch level versus overfitting at the image level. So overfitting at the image level means that at the highest kind of point of your model, right? Your model is this kind of like, there's layers that go all the way from the layers that are close to the image, which are the low level features, which are the patches, 
and then you go up and up and up and up all the way to the class, like the head, right? The model head, right? So you have the patch level part of the model, which is the bottom, and then you have the head part of the model, which is the top. So what they're saying is that you can actually have underfitting at the patch level and overfitting at the image level, which means that your model head is kind of overfit to the data, right? It, it, it has already memorized the data because it's smaller, the head is smaller. But the patches, especially if you have a huge vision transformer, there's a lot more model capacity in there, so they're actually underfit. So this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, observation there, where when you have these giant models where the bottom is just absolutely massive, and then you have like these tiny little classification heads, right, that maybe only have a thousand uh, classes at the top, you can end up in a world where your head is overfit, and then the bottom part of your model is underfit. Uh, Sinkhorn NOP centering. Recommend to replace the teacher softmax centering step of Dino and iBot by the Sinkhorn NOP batch normalization. Okay, so I don't really know what the fuck this is, but it's pro it seems like it's just some kind of normalization, batch normalization, layer norms, and probably 500 IQ like combination of like normalization at specific layers, right? Co Leo regularizer, another uh, regularizer here. Differential entropy estimation encourages a uniform span of the features within a batch. Okay, so another type of like uh, batch norm where normally what batch norm is saying is that the actual values for all the kind of activations in between layers of for the batch should be roughly the same, right? You don't want, uh, if you have a batch of 10 images, you don't want one of the images to have like super high uh, activations and then everything else in the batch is basically just zero. You want to like kind of normalize them in such a way that all of them have a little bit of signal, right? So you can have a little bit more uh, information coming through. So this is kind of the same idea. Given a set of n vectors, you have the loss coleo. So this is right L. This fancy script L just means it's a loss function, right? So you want this to be lower. You have negative 1 over n and the summation from i equals 1 to n. So this just means an average. An average of the log of dni, where dni is the minimum xi minus xj. So if you have n vectors, x1 to xn, right, and there's going to be, a batch is going to be a set of vectors, right? If you have a batch of 10 images, you feed them to your image encoder, you're going to get a set of, or a batch of 10 vectors. And then they're saying, okay, the difference between, the minimum difference between these vectors, and then I want the minimum difference between these vectors, the absolute difference here, right? That's what these little double bars mirror mean and this is L1, L1 loss, right? The log of that, sum it over all the batch, get the average, that's the loss. So it's like an extra regularization term. We also L2 normalize the features before computing this regularizer. Okay, so a lot of fancy uh, regularization and normalization going on here. Uh, adapting the resolution. Increasing image resolution is key to pixel level downstream tasks such as segmentation or detection where small objects disappear at low resolutions. Yeah, this is kind of interesting because one thing that we saw, right, at, it's in this paper here at the very beginning is uh, this picture here of these horses. Like, these horses are absolutely tiny. Right, like look at this picture. It's like an overhead image of like 50 horses on a green field and it's picking out the individual horses, right? So if you were to like downsample all these images to like a 256 by 256 or something, you would lose all of that, right? You would no longer have the ability to like kind of pick out tiny things in large high resolution images. So how do they do that? So the way that they do that is that they train at high resolution, which is time and memory demanding. And instead, they increase the resolution of images to 518 by 518 during a short period at the end of pre-training. Mm, okay, so they have like a schedule here, right? 
or a curriculum is another word for this, right? Where you have training on a specific data set at the beginning and then you train on a different data set afterwards, right? You have a curriculum that you, that you use. And here the curriculum is low resolution images and then high resolution images. We consider several improvements to train the models. We train models on A100s using PyTorch 2.0. That's pretty cool. They're using kind of the bleeding edge. What did I just do? I just accidentally went all the way down. Uh, the code is available along with pre-trained models used for feature extraction. So the pre-trained model that I assume they used to uh, get the embeddings that they use for the similarity search. That's probably what they mean by this one. With the same hardware compared to the iBot implementation, the Dino V2 code runs around two times faster and only one third of the memory. Fast and efficient and memory efficient attention. Yeah, so one of the biggest problems with transformers is because they basically multiply every vector by every other vector, like the length of your sequence is actually determining the size of the overall memory, right? So if you have a very small sequence, your memory footprint is gonna be small, but as soon as you increase the, the sequence length, right, the memory grows quadratically with that. So transformers are very memory hungry, right? There's some techniques that people have come up with to reduce the amount of memory that transformers take, but it's still, it can still be pretty bad. So let's see what they uh, do here. We implement our own version of flash attention to improve memory usage and speed on the self-attention layers. Our version is on par with or better than the original on all cases considered while covering more use cases in hardware. Due to the GPU hardware specifics, the efficiency is best when the embedding dimension per head is a multiple of 64. Yeah. So this is an important thing to consider is that sometimes people don't realize it, but a lot of the hyperparameters for the model architecture are not even chosen because they result in better performance. They're chosen because they're uh, specific to the hardware that they're trained on, right? So Google models, are going to be the hyperparameters for the model architecture of a model that's trained at Google is going to be specific to the size of the TPU that it's being trained on, right? The uh, model parameter or the model hyperparameters for the model architecture that uh, Facebook trains are going to be specific to their A100 GPU. So these dimensions, right? The size of the model head, the size of the uh, embeddings that you have within your uh, vision transformer, all of those are gonna be specific to the hardware. Uh, matrix are even better when the full embedding dimension is a multiple of 256. As a consequence, our VITG architecture slightly differs from the architecture proposed in order to maximize compute efficiency. We use an embedding dif dimension of 1536 with 24 heads rather than 1406 with 16 heads. Yeah, so bigger model, but also chosen so that it works better. And yeah, this is like a, this paper is booby trapped with, <laughs> with uh, references, so I can't click. 14,000. Our VITG backbone counts 1.1 billion parameters, which is quite big. Nested tensors and self-attention. Our version also allows running in the same forward pass the global crop and the local crop that have different numbers of patch tokens, leading to significant compute efficiency gains compared to using separate forward and backward passes as done in prior implementations. Okay, so basically, How do I describe this? I don't know. Let's not describe this. <laughs> Efficient stochastic depths. We implement an improved version of stochastic depth that skips the computation of the dropped residuals rather than masking the result. So 
in these transformers sometimes you mask specific parts and also they said that they were dropping out specific patches in the transformer so whenever you have dropout in your model and just PyTorch, a lot of times it's actually still getting calculated and then it's just getting zeroed out, right? So you're actually spending some amount of compute calculating uh, activations which are just gonna get dropped out. So you could probably save by not having to calculate those. Hope you're doing well. It will be great if you could try to do live implementations from scratch by referring to the architecture in the paper. Yeah, I mean, I can try to, but I think it's important to realize that the implementations of papers is kind of fading away, right? It's poss it, was poss it used to be possible to implement uh, machine learning papers because they were trained on similar hardware and they were made by basically one or two people and a six month kind of research project. But this is not that, right? This is a model trained on million dollar systems uh, created by teams of 20 people. So it's basically impossible to re-implement these, right? You're not gonna re-implement this paper. What you can do is you can take this uh, vision transformer and use it in your own uh, technique, right? You can, you can go and you can download this exact vision transformer and you can use it for some kind of cool, new, interesting thing or app or, or task that you have I think that's definitely doable. You can do that as a single person, but as a single person, it's basically impossible to re-implement this paper because you don't, there's just not enough time, right? You, you're not a 20 person team. You're not gonna have a half million dollars to spend on GPUs. Uh, this saves memory and compute in proportion approximately equal to the drop rate thanks to specific fused kernels. Uh, fused kernels, so Obviously, whenever you create a uh, deep learning uh, model, it gets compiled into these CUDA kernels, which are what actually is running on your GPU. And those CUDA kernels, like joining them together or fusing them as it's called, is one of the best ways to get better efficiency and uh, speed or use less compute, basically. So that's another, uh, requirement that is driving the model architecture where we saw we know how the model architecture here they were describing how it's they're choosing the dimensions of these things based on what fits inside the gpus and then not only that but then also the specific ordering of these kernels and like is also chosen because they want specific current specific uh operations specific ops to be close together so that they can fuse them right so the hardware is driving the model architecture development. With high drop rates, this allows a drastic improvement in compute efficiency and memory. This implementation contains, consists of randomly shuffling B batches over the batch dimension and slicing the first one minus D batches for computations in the block. Okay, so basically if you have a very high drop rate, then you can save a lot on compute. Fully sharded data parallel. So data parallelism is a form of distributed training, right? You have model parallelism and you have data parallelism. One kind of way to think about it is that in model parallelism, you have your model split across multiple devices. In data parallelism, you have your uh, batches or your data split across multiple devices. In, in uh, practice, usually there's a combination of both. There's both data parallelism and model parallelism. Minimizing our objective with the Atom W optimizer requires four model replicas in float32 precision. So there's four versions of the model in float32. And this is interesting here. So I would have thought that they would have done this in mixed precision. So, right, when you're training models, every single parameter in that model is taking 32. Uh, units of storage, right? So their float 32 takes up 32, something like a float 16 takes half as much memory because it only takes 16. And then something like a, a, a uint eight takes eight and then something like a, a four byte, right? So there's like, basically you can keep having the memory by reducing the precision. So mixed, uh, preci or mixed precision training is something that's popular. 
And I'm curious as to whether they did that, but let's see. Uh, so uh, this sums up to 16 gigabytes of memory for a billion parameter model. Okay, that's kind of cool. So I could actually fit that on my 3090. In order to reduce this memory footprint per GPU, we split the model replicas across GPU, sharding 16 gigabytes across GPUs using the PyTorch implementation of FSDP, which is just fully sharded data parallel. Consequently, the model size is not bounded by the memory of a single GPU, but by the total sum of the GPU memory across compute nodes. Yeah. So this is more model parallelism. The PyTorch implementation of FSDP brings a second advantage, which is to save on cross GPU communication costs. So this is another uh, kind of theme where more and more uh, the GPU is no longer the limiting factor in these training problems, right? Usually it's not the fact that your GPU can't matrix multiply fast enough, which used to be the case. Nowadays, the uh, limiting reagent is actually that the GPU is sitting there idle waiting for information to be sent to a different GPU or come back to, from the computer, right? So the communication between these GPUs is actually now the limiting factor, which is why you're seeing uh, the rise of kind of these advanced kind of like hardware interconnects that like, uh, I think the best example of this is the Tesla Dojo chip, right? Where they basically put these like right next to each other in such a way like this, yeah, so that the communication between these is a lot faster, right? Because if you look at like a server rack right now, the, the data has to go through a PCIe slot into the memory and then back into another thing, right? So like the communication is starting to become part of it. So at this point, people are starting to do more crazy things like these uh, compute planes compute mesh, right, where the GPUs are like right next to each other so that they can very quickly communicate and you're no longer limited by that. Uh, the weight shards are stored in 32 precision as required, but broadcasting weights and reducing gradients is done in float, team, float 16 precision. Okay, so they are doing some kind of mixed precision stuff here, right? MLP head gradients are reduced in float 32 to avoid training. This leads to approximately 50% reduction in communication costs compared to the float 32 gradient all reduced operations used in distributed data parallel, which is used in other self-supervised pre-training methods. As a consequence, the training procedure styles scales more efficiently than DDP with float 16 autocast when scaling the number of GPU nodes. Overall, PyTorch FSDP mix precision is superior. 2TDP with autocast. Very cool. And you know what's even cooler is that all of this is available, right? I'm telling you, like low key, I feel like uh, Meta's, Meta is the open AI company. Meta is much more open. They release their tools. They talk about their tools. They talk about the techniques. Like that's what I wanna see. You know, I wanna see that. I like this building out in the open much more commendable than uh, OpenAI's building in secret. Most of our technical improvements to the training loop aim at improving the training of large models over large quantities of data. For smaller models, we distill them from our largest model instead of training them from scratch. Yeah, this is huge. Like, it seems like such an easy thing to like intuit of like, hey, rather than training four different size models from scratch, why don't we just train one really huge model and then just distill the smaller ones from the bigger one? That does seem like, I'm like, wow, why didn't people think of that before? Since our objective function is a form of distillation from the teacher network to the student network, we leverage the same training loop with a few exceptions. We use a larger model as a frozen teacher. Keep a spare EMA of the student that we use as our final model. Uh, so this is the exponential moving average of the student. They probably have multiple students that are being trained in parallel, and then they basically average them together to have the uh, student that they end up publishing. Oh shit, look at that. Nice little ablation study. Look at that. So they tell you here are all the different uh, techniques that they described for training these big models. And then here is all the improvements that you get. So layer scale, stochastic depth, teacher momentum, tweak warm-up schedules, batch size. What's the biggest one here is this. 
There you go, dude. That's or actually I guess this. R reproduction. I don't know what that means. Making the batch size big is so important. That's something that like I feel like I learned. And time and time again, it it's it just seems to be the most important part. It's like the bigger your batch size, the more stable your training and the and the better the final solution that you get to. Which is unfortunate because like as an independent researcher, as someone who kind of only has uh, like consumer GPUs, you can't train on these giant batch sizes. You need these kind of distributed systems, distributed kind of like multiple nodes with like hundreds of GPUs in order to have these massive batch sizes. We optimize for KNN performance as in our experiments, the linear probe performance is lower bounded by the KNN performance. Some modifications like layer scale and a high stochastic depth rate 0.4 incur a decrease in linear probe, but have the benefits of increasing the stability by avoiding NAN loss values. These modifications allowed for the next set of improvements to be added. We present a set of ablations to empirically validate different components of our pipeline the technical modifications, the pre-training data, and the impact of model distillation. We consider various downstream tasks that are described in section seven. Okay, so this is kind of a description of all the different ablation studies. So basically that table, but they're gonna go through all the different parts here. Uh, our approach improves the IBOT method by combining it with several existing components described in section four. To evaluate their importance, we train multiple models where we successively add components to the baseline IBOT model. So we report the top one accuracy. So top one accuracy is the hardest accuracy. So top five is the is basically as long as your model, as long as the answer to the actual classification problem is within the top five responses with the highest confidence, then you count that as a success. Top one accuracy is much more stringent. It means that you have to, the highest confidence class has to be the right answer. Generally, we observe that each component improves the performance on either KNN or linear probing, only layer scale and stochastic depth, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Quality of the features is directly related to the quality of the pre-training data. That's a obvious statements 101 right there. Uh, we randomly sample 142 million images from the same data source. We train a VITG14 on each data set for the same number of iterations and include a variant of ImageNet 22K. The most salient observation is that training on a curated set of images works better on most benchmarks than training on uncurated data. I mean, are they keeping the number of images the same or are they? Yeah, so this is the problem is that they're comparing a 142 million curated image data set to 142 million uncurated images. So if the size of the data set is the same, of course the curated data is gonna be better, right? But if you were to say 142 million curated images compared to 300 million uncurated images now, I don't know if you would get the same result. It might be the case that the uncurated images, because they're just bigger, would be better. What are your thoughts on cloud GPUs? Cloud GPUs are very useful, I guess. It's like kind of the way to go. Like if I was at a startup, I wouldn't buy GPUs and train things locally. I would use the cloud. The problem is that cloud GPUs can get very expensive very quickly. So unless you have a bunch of VC money to, to burn, the cloud GPUs are generally, you know what I'm saying, prohibitively expensive for individual people. Like if you wanna mess around on your own GPU at home, you know, that's not that expensive. But if you wanna mess around on like A100s, pretty soon you're gonna end up with a, a couple hundred dollars of AWS bills, you know, so. Cloud GPUs is pretty much the way to go. It's just expensive. So you have to be a startup or a company or maybe an academic institution that has kind of a budget. When compared with models trained on ImageNet 22K, training is also superior to all the benchmarks. Okay, what do we got here? Ablation of open source training data. We compare the INET 22K that was used 
Okay, so here you have different training data sets. You have their 142 million curated, you have the 142 million uncurated, and you can actually see here the difference. It's only, it's only a slight difference, or actually it's a big difference here. Look at that. 59 compared to 73 for the uncurated versus curated. And ImageNet 22K here, it's actually very similar, look at that. So, I mean, what I'm learning from this is that the ImageNet 22K data set is roughly equivalent to the LVD 142 mil. So how many INET uh, 22K? INET 22K data set. Size. Like how many images does this have? Forty two mil. I think I actually see it here. So you see ImageNet 22K has 14 million images and LVD 142 mil has 142 million images. So this is kind of interesting here that this data set, which has 10 times less data, right? This says 14 million images is getting slightly better performance on ImageNet 1K than the LVD 142 mil. I mean, obviously it's a more specific data set. So it makes sense that the ImageNet data set is gonna be like kind of better for ImageNet, but Still crazy that 10 times more data doesn't give you a huge performance boost. Uh, model size and data. We quantify the importance of scaling data with model size. As the model size grow, training becomes more beneficial than training on ImageNet 22K. Yeah, so the bigger models, if you train a big giant model on a small data set, it's just gonna overfit hard. So you can only train these big models if you have big data sets the two go together. VITG trained on LVD142 matches the performance on ImageNet 1K. We validated the proposed technical improvements by adding them incrementally. This section analyzes the performance hit observed if we ablate specific loss terms, starting from our best performing model. We ablate the importance of the co-leo loss and the impact of the masked image modeling term. Uh, AD20K, so here are a couple different benchmarks that they're gonna use to compare. Table sheet 3A shows the impact of using the Colio loss. Model scale versus data scale. So here on the x-axis, you have the uh, sizes of the vision transformers that they're used, right? So L, uh, huge, and then G is the biggest one. So these are the smaller and then bigger. And then on the X or Y axis here, I guess this is probably the performance, the top one performance or something like that. So you can see here that uh, the bigger models, right, are able to more effectively use the big data set. So this is a INET 22K is a small data, smaller, it's like 10 times smaller than LVD 142 mil. So you can see that the when you have a smaller model, right, a VITL, which is still a pretty big model, the smaller model doesn't use the big data set as effectively as the bigger model. If you give the big model and the big data set, you get better performance, but small model, big data set doesn't do as well, which is kind of what they're showing you here. Uh, for small architectures, we distill larger models instead of training them from scratch. We use the distillation procedure described in section five. Uh, we evaluate the effectiveness of this approach by comparing a VITL14 trained from scratch with one distilled from a VITG14. Oh, okay, this is pretty cool. So, all right, so we were talking about distillation as a method of basically having smaller versions of the model, right? You train one giant model from scratch and then you distill the smaller models. But, is that going to be the same performance as a small model trained from scratch? And that's what they're showing you here. Is the VITL trained from scratch is this blue, and this is the score that it gets on all these different categories. I, I kind of like this, this weird table here, right? So each of these is a 
uh, benchmark. So uh, cars, food, ImageNet, uh, Kitty, which is a kind of a autonomous vehicle data set and so on. Let's zoom in here. So you can see that actually when you train it from scratch, it's worse on everything. Like the distilled model is actually better on everything. And, and here's the even crazier thing. The distilled model is better than the teacher model. Right? Like what the fuck? That's weird to think about. You take a big model, you train it from scratch, you use the big model to train a smaller model, right? You The smaller model is distilled from the bigger model. And it turns out that the smaller model trained on the bigger model is better at Oxford H and Paris H. That's kind of weird, right? Not intuitive. We show that a VITL model distilled from a frozen VITG outperforms the same model and sometimes even outperforms the distillation target. We measure the impact of changing the resolution during pre-training on the performance image of image and patch level features. We consider models trained from scratch using a fixed resolution of 224 or 416 by 416. So these are the two different sizes that they train at. Uh, we resume for 10K more iterations at 416. So they're doing this kind of like curriculum, like alternating training on uh, larger images and smaller images. Uh, we report the performance of a linear probe evaluated at various resolutions. The model trained on high resolution images performs the best across resolutions, but it comes at a high cost. Training at 416 pixels by 416 pixels takes three times more compute than training at 224. So there's this kind of trade off of like, ideally, we train on. Bitter lesson seems to kill low budget academic AI, simply scale up everything. Yeah, that's true. Uh, how does distilling differ from transfer learning? So transfer learning is taking a model that has already been trained and then using it for a new task. So in transfer learning, you're still using the original model, but when you're distilling, you're, you're training a separate smaller model, right? So distillation is taking a big model and then using it to train a small model. Transfer learning is using a model and then training it on a new task. Uh, training on high resolution for only 10K iterations at the end of the training is almost as good and only requiring a fraction of the compute. In this section, we present the empirical evaluation of our models on many image understanding tasks. We evaluate both global and local image representations on category and instance level recognition. So these are a couple different uh, computer vision tasks, right? You have instance level recognition, semantic segmentation, monocular depth estimation or prediction, and then action recognition. So this is a lot of different type of tasks, right? Action recognition is kind of like classification. And a lot of times this is like a pose detection task, right? So you're like kind of detecting key points on a human or a hand or something like that. Monocular depth estimation is taking a single camera image and then giving you the depth image from that. So it's like a pixel level task because you have to identify the depth at every single pixel. Instance level recognition, that's more of like a bounding box task. So it's not pixel level, it's just give me the bounding box of a specific uh, instance, right? Or like object within the image. And then semantic segmentation is also pixel level because it's like you have to tell me what the class of every single pixel in that image is. So you have a couple different, a lot of like a big smear of different tasks here. You have like pixel kind of level tasks and you have uh, more high level things such as detection and action recognition. So we train linear classifiers on top of the frozen features. Linear classifiers is just a fancy way of saying like a little tiny model head. Right, so if you had ImageNet 1K, the linear classifier is basically you're taking that giant pre-trained uh, feature encoder and they freeze it so they don't let any gradients get into it. And then you just put a little tiny head on top and that little tiny head has 1000 outputs and each of those 1000 outputs represents one of the ImageNet classes. Uh, let's 
short duration and results close to training. Okay, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at the image resolution. So this is 224 by 224 and then 768 by 768. So this is high resolution images and low resolution images on the X axis. And then on the Y axis, you have a mean IOU, which is basically a way to evaluate uh, bounding boxes. So here's a, this is a low IOU. This is a high IOU, intersection over union, right? So like how much does the bounding box that you predicted overlap the true ground truth bounding box, right? So higher is better and then higher is better as well on accuracy. So accuracy is, this is a classification task. So accuracy is basically, did you get it correct? And you can see here that the low resolution goes down. So if you're training your model at a low resolution, it does not perform well at high resolution. If you train your model at high resolution, it does perform well at high resolution. But then this blue line here is this kind of curriculum technique that they just uh, described where they train at a low resolution and then they train at a high resolution. So they like kind of do this two part curriculum and they show you that, okay, well actually that works pretty much as good as the high resolution, right? It's still better to train at the high resolution if you, if you wanted to, but it's gonna be so much more compute heavy that you're actually better off doing this kind of like curriculum technique where they train at a low resolution and then the high resolution and it performs quite about the same. Second, we show that they match or surpass the performance of a weekly supervised ones on substantial image number, a substantial number of tasks. In our comparisons, we use two kinds of models as baselines. We compare the best performing self-supervised models that are openly available. We run our evaluations for MAE, Dino, SEER, MSN, ESVIT, and iBot. These are just basically a bunch of things that they're comparing to. Uh, several architectural variants were proposed. We report results for the one that leads to the best top one accuracy. We report performance of open source weekly supervised models such as CLIP. Okay, so they're of course gonna compare to CLIP because CLIP is like extremely popular. Uh, for reference, blah, blah, blah. Okay, ImageNet classification. As a first evaluation, we pro probe the quality of the holistic image representation produced by the model. So what does that mean? What is the quality of an image feature, right? This is, This is a fundamental problem in machine learning in general, right? The quality of your embeddings, the quality of your features. And right now, kind of the gold standard is basically to have a nice varied set of benchmarks, right? And this is not just a problem in computer vision, it's a problem in uh, natural language as well, or any kind of image modality, right? How do you determine the quality of the features of a giant LLM, right? Well, you have a variety of benchmarks and then you evaluate its performance on all those benchmarks. So that's kind of the same thing that you're gonna do here for the uh, computer vision model. It's like, okay, well, are these features good? Are they better than that feature or that feature, right? It's like, it's impossible to know as a human because it's just like, what what is a 1000 dimensional vector? Like, it's basically, you can't understand what the fuck that even means. So how can you judge the quality of it? So. Right now, the way that people do it is they basically just create these like benchmarks and they have like as big of a set of benchmarks as they can. And then the model that performs the best on all the benchmarks has the best features. But I suspect that over time, we will start to learn more and more about like what those features actually mean, maybe better techniques for understanding, maybe clustering the features. Like I suspect that we'll develop kind of a whole science around feature understanding and kind of like that will become the new way to determine feature quality rather than what we're doing now, which is basically just uh, using benchmarks in order to kind of as a proxy for the feature quality. Because most SSL methods using uh, validation performance, we also report top one accuracy on ImageNet. We run the evaluation with our code. Our, we compare our frozen features to the best publicly available SSL features regardless of architecture or pre-training data. Yeah, we also see that the performance increase on alternative test sets is larger for our method indicating stronger generalization. So again, this we don't really know how to measure generalization well, 
other than to just basically evaluate the model on a variety of different tests and then see if it performs well across all of them. We also want to validate that our features are competitive with state-of-the-art open source weekly supervised models. So open clip and Eva clip. Let's see, let's see how you perform. This is the magic number right here. So we got clip with a VIT large. Uh, and then these are different uh, data, uh, benchmarks here and you get 79. You have Eva clip with a VITG, so this is a bigger bigger clip, 83. Dino V2 with the VITG, bigger one, 83. Okay, so it's it's not better, but it's competitive. I see what they're saying. How does it compare to Dino VITS? I mean, this is a smaller one, so it's not a fair comparison. 78, right? Small VIT with only eight patches, you get 78. Small VIT with 14 patches, you get 79. So this is a little bit uns like maybe unsettling. It tells you that Dino V2 is not necessarily that much better than Dino V1. Really, it's just bigger, right? And this here, this 14336, I think this just means that the, the, the head dimension itself is 336, so it's a slightly bigger head. So VITL14 is slightly smaller than a VITL14336. Can we fine tune the encoders? We question if the ability of our models to produce high quality frozen features impact their performance when fine tuned with supervision on a specific data set. Yeah, this is important because I myself tried to do this, right? When I, I was messing with the segment anything model and I was using the pre-trained feature encoder that they had. And I had, I was trying two different things. I was like, okay, well, if I freeze this pre-trained feature encoder and then try to do this segmentation task, is it better or is it actually worse than if I, don't freeze it and let some of the gradients flow through it. And intuitively, if you if you have been doing this, generally the advice up until now is that yes, letting some gradients go through it is better than just freezing it, right? But while this is not core, this experiment is indicative of whether we have involuntarily specialized blah, blah, blah. We apply the fine tuning pipeline without tweaking hyperparameters. We show that the top one accuracy on the validation set improves by more than 2%. Here you go. When the backbone is fine tuned. So we're still good. We're, it seems like fine tuning, you can still get a tiny bit of performance, right? And I don't know, I feel like this is gonna go away, right? I feel like over time, these uh, feature encoders, right? These pre-trained uh, models like this, right? These pre-trained backbones, I think we're gonna to get to a point where you actually don't wanna to fine tune them because they're already so good, they're already so specific and so general, right? They can kind of work on everything and the features that they use are like so fragile because they're they're giant and the learning rates that they use are very small and like they're in, they're in a local minima that is so deep that if you try to fine tune them, you basically just mess them up. So it's interesting to see that fine tuning these uh, Feature encoders is still, you're still gonna get a little bit of performance for your specific task, but I do feel like this is kind of eventually gonna go away. Fine tuning is optional. Yeah, that's, that's the future is fine tuning is optional. To complement our study and probe the generalization of our features, we evaluate our ImageNet 1K models trained with linear classification heads on domain generalization benchmarks. Okay, so these are benchmarks specifically chosen that to be kind of like very wide, lots of different weird looking images in order to determine if your model is overfit to ImageNet or not. Uh, 
they keep using SSL here. That just means self-supervised learning. They just shortened it into SSL. Uh, supervised fine tuning on ImageNet 1K. Is it ready to be used? I didn't see any docs on how to use the model to input an image and get the retrieval against a given set of images. So yeah, you can do this. So if you took, uh, Gustavo, if you took this right here, this model, and then went, created a, Py a Python script that uh, fed every single one of your images through this uh, pre-trained encoder, you're gonna get a set of, vec you're gonna get a vector and then store all of those vectors in a vector database, such as uh, this one here, F-A-I-S-S, -S, right? Then you can take any new image, encode it, and then find all the images that are similar to it. So you can, you can implement retrieval if you want pretty easily, right? This is the, the key is that you can download this model right here. You don't even need to download it. You can just imp like uh, load it with a Python. So, if you combine this with this, you can do uh, retrieval based on similarity. We could actually probably do that. That actually probably seems like a stream that I could do if you guys wanna do that. If you guys are interested in that, uh, join the Discord and then uh, comment on that and we could totally do that as a stream. Okay, let's get back to it. Uh, VITG, supervised fine tuning. So here they're showing you uh, fine tuning at slightly different resolutions. And you can see that the slightly larger resolution image benefits a little bit better from the fine tuning. Incorporating prompting is eventually better than fine-tuning. Yeah, uh, Fee Nugen Van, I'm, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your name right, but I actually think that that's what I envision. I think right here, this paper is obviously they trained it with no text. This is a pure image foundation model, right? It's not like Clip. Clip is a image and text foundation model. And part of the reason they did that is because the data sets for image and text are not as good, right? But I think eventually what's gonna happen is that you're gonna basically use a kind of like auto labeling technique, right? You're gonna take images, you're gonna use clip to create a, uh, a caption for that image, and then you're gonna train a text and image uh, model on the captioned images. So I think over time, the quality and the availability of image text data is actually going to improve because we have models such as clip that can understand it. So I see this kind of, this giant self-supervised pipeline where you're kind of like captioning the models and then using that to train and then using the better model to caption the model, to caption more images and then so on. And you have this kind of like flywheel that like keeps labeling images and keeps captioning and then keeps labeling and then keeps captioning. And then over time it actually gets better. Cause I do think that intuitively it seems like having additional modalities, right? Having both image and text will result in a better uh, feature space than just images by themselves. But we're at the point now where scale is still king. And if you can have a bigger data set by just using only images, the features that come out of that are gonna be better. How powerful this will be to be used as an image labeling tool. Is this, I mean, uh, this is the, what you want here. So Gustavo, this table here, table four, you see here, uh, clip is about 79, Eva clip is about 83, Dino V2 79. So it's not, it's not gonna be like significantly better than what you have access to already, but it's kind of on par, right? I think if you use Dino V2, if you use this, mod, this uh, encoder, and then just basically fine tune or not fine tune, but like use it for your own uh, task, you're probably gonna get about the same uh, performance as you were if you were to use Eva Clip or any of these other kind of large foundational vision models. So it's not a step function. It's not like we, uh, we suddenly unlocked a new capability. It just seems like uh, competitive with the current models.
Domain generalization with a linear probe. See, this is more interesting. So frozen features. So what they did here is they freeze the features. They say, okay, I'm not going to fine tune this. I'm going to freeze the encoder and then I'm gonna to try to see how good it performs on these uh, benchmarks here, IMR, IMA. And open clip is actually very fragile. If you see that, open clip, if you freeze it and you don't push gradients into it, it actually doesn't perform very well at all, right? It's, it doesn't have the ability to generalize. But look at Dino V2, 75. That's much better. That means that the frozen features of Dino V2 are actually much more general than the frozen features of these other models here. Open clip, Dino V1, MAE, and so on. So, I don't know, I would still use this. If I was doing a computer vision problem, I feel like this is the feature encoder I would use today. <laughs> Additional image and video classification. Okay, so they're using this for video now. We studied the generalization of our features on downstream classification benchmarks. We consider two sets of evaluations in that context. On one hand, we use large and fine-grained data sets such as iNaturalist and Places 205. Okay, so I think these are also classification tasks. We train with a linear classifier and data augmentations. Our model significantly performs open clip You know, this is that table right there. We measure the performance of our model on video action recognition, right? So this is basically like YouTube videos where it's like someone cooking and like someone riding a bicycle and things like that. And it's basically a classification task, but you have a kind of a sequence of frames, right? So you're performing classification with a bunch of images rather than a single image. We pick eight evenly spaced frames, so it's not very dense yet, right? It's not like you're looking at a two hour video, you're looking at eight frames of a video, so. Video is still primitive. Uh, we see that amongst the self-supervised approaches, our model clearly sets a new state of the art. Okay, so they're saying it clearly outperforms on SSV2 and SSV2 is a more complicated data set. I haven't really heard about this. What is S something something V2? Something something V2. Something something V2. So it seems like it's like kind of, these are still pretty low resolution, but it's like egocentric video of someone like grabbing things putting something on a surface, moving something up, so covering something with something, putting something into something. That's kind of a cool data set. I've, I'd never heard of this, but okay. It's like kind of like an egocentric data set of like opening a jar and putting something in it. So that is kind of interesting. SSV2 requires a much richer understanding of the video frames. Yeah, it's you can't just like classify based on texture, right? Jesus Christ. Uh, we compare select frozen features on 12 transfer classification benchmarks. This benchmark covers scenes, objects, textures, blah, blah, blah. Our model outperforms other self-supervised learning models. Okay, so here you have image classification, video classification, a couple different versions. Here's the SSV2 that we just looked at. Open clip, very bad performance here. Actually not, it's actually not that much worse than Dino V2. It, I guess just SSV2 is a very hard data set. That's a fucking hard data set. Look at that, 35% is the state of the art on that. That's good. You know, you want benchmarks where everyone performs poorly, right? You want a benchmark that's very, very difficult. Like these benchmarks here that where like everyone's scoring in the high 90s, those aren't good benchmarks because basically once you get to like, uh, like 90%, 95%, getting that last extra percent is not a measure of how good your model is. It's like a measure of how overfit your model is. So this is why I think that as our uh, models get better and better over time, the benchmarks need to get harder and harder over time. So I feel like ImageNet 1K 
is not a good data set anymore or is not a good benchmark anymore because it's like every single score is high. Like for example, this here, CFAR 10, I think that's what C10 means. Like this is borderline meaningless. Like what does 98.7 versus 99.5 mean, right? It just means it got one more image correct basically or like a couple more images correct. And the reason it got those correct is probably not necessarily a good reason. So these data sets here, flowers, like look at these 99, 99, like, I think we need to start getting rid of some of these benchmarks that are too easy now, right? This one, much better benchmark. You're still at 80, 63, 87, right? You can still actually tell what's a better model than the other, but like these data sets that are just way too easy, these benchmarks too easy. Even though these benchmarks favor text-guided pre-training, our features are still competitive with OpenClip on most classification benchmarks. Instance recognition is a different problem now. On uh, the task of instance level recognition using non-parametric approach. Uh, ranked according to their cosine similarity with a query image, we evaluated our model and compared two baselines on Paris and Oxford that are landmark recognition benchmarks. We also evaluate on MET, a data set of artworks from the Metropolitan Museum. Okay, a couple different instance segmentation or instance recognition benchmarks here. We probe the quality of patch level features. So patch level features versus just features, right? So normally when they say features, what they're referring to is what comes out at the end of the pre-trained uh, encoder, right? So you have your vision transformer, you have your image, your image gets fed into your vision transformer, and then outside of that, you have a feature, right? And that's the feature vector that they're normally referring to. When they say patch level features, what they're referring to is the features in the little individual patches of the vision transformer, right? The vision transformer is cutting up the image into this like grid, and then each of that little grid is getting fed into a different, usually a different part of the vision transformer. So you can look at the features that are at the end of the vision transformer, or you can look at the features that are for each individual little patch that the vision transformer is uh, using, right? So that's uh, what they mean here by the probing the quality of the patch level features as opposed to just the features at the very top. Uh, instance level recognition, so this is a different benchmark, right? So up here we were looking at uh, image and video classification. This is now instance level recognition, and we can see how, again, you're seeing Dino V2 kind of beating out all the other models. And then semantic segmentation, a different kind of task. Again, this is semantic segmentation is, I mean, you guys probably know what segmentation is, but just in case you don't, uh, which is this, right? It's like basically individual labeling for each individual pixel. Hey, can you suggest which models will work well on Kvasir dataset uh, for classification purposes? What is Kvasir dataset? Kvasir data set. Multi-class image data set for computer. So it's like this. Ooh, these are, these are kind of gross, dude. <laughs> oh. Lifted polyps. Oh my God, dude, this is nasty. <laughs> Ulcerative colitis. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, God bless you for uh, performing medical segmentation. Like some of the, some of those medical image data set tasks are like fucking nasty. Like the the ones for like uh, skin diseases. Like like you know what I'm saying. Like I've seen some shit on those like skin disease data sets. Uh, which models will work well? So it seems like it's like a kind of a classification data set. So here you go, man. I mean classification. Dino V2, VIT G14, there you go. So right here, this is the one you want. VIT G14, import torch, torch.hub.load. 
uh, Pratt to use, take this model, uh, take your data set, this uh, whatever you whatever this was here, uh, encode every single one of these images with this pre-trained frozen encoder, and then train a linear classifier on top of that. That's a good start. I'm not telling you that that's going to give you the best possible performance. There's probably all kinds of extra tricks that you can use to make a better performance for this thing, but that's probably a good start, is taking this pre-trained feature encoder, encoding all your images, and then training a classifier on top of that. Uh, semantic segmentation. For our semantic segmentation evaluation, we consider two different setups. Linear. Linear layer is trained to predict class logits from a patch tokens. This is used to produce a low resolution logit map. Okay, so logits are basically the output of a classification head before it is put into a softmax and then turned into a confidence. And generally your cross entropy is actually done with the logits because the way that the kind of kernels work out, it's actually better to do it that way. Or not better, but like uh, computationally it's, it's faster. Uh, this procedure is simple, but cannot easily produce high resolution segmentations. We report the performance of our model variants as well as the baselines on three data sets. Interestingly, our evaluation is on par with fully fine tuning on upper net decoder. So this is kind of interesting. They're doing like a little bit So like these pre-trained encoders, right? They give you a feature vector and the feature vector is very easy to use for a classification task because all you got to do is just put a, like a little classifier head on top of that. But once you have a more complicated task, right? Like a, a segmentation task, then maybe you want to have a little bit more complicated of a head. And that's kind of what they're talking about here is like different uh, ideas, right? Like a decoder, a uh, logit map, right? Like making a little 32 by 32 logit map. So a couple different, there's still some technique, still some art, still some artistry that you can use to uh, design that little, uh, what you can do with those features basically. Like how are you gonna take those features and use it for your classification task? All right, so here we go. This is uh, classification, This is these are, uh, uh, Kitty is like a autonomous vehicle data set. And I guess here lower is better, so you see that it's outperforming the clip, but not by much. Depth estimation. This is another uh, kind of dense task, similar to segmentation, where you have to predict every single pixel. We consider three different setups. We extract the last layer of the frozen transformer and concatenate the class token into each patch token. We then bilinearly upsample the tokens to increase the resolution. And finally, we train a simple linear layer using a classification loss by dividing the depth prediction range into 256 uniformly distributed bits. So when you're doing depth, right, the depth image is going to basically be the same exact resolution as the colored image that you input, except every single pixel is going to be a number that represents how far away that pixel is from the camera, right? And because the depth image is usually a uint8 single channel grayscale image, right, in a uint8, you have 256 possible values, right, like zero to 255. So they turn it into a classification task of like, hey, rather than trying to regress the exact depth number as a float. Instead of that, turn it into a classification task. And for each pixel, I'm trying to classify each pixel into one of 256 different classes. So it turns a depth estimation task into a semantic segmentation task with 256 classes. Uh, okay, they do some kind of concatenating the tokens from layers. Three, six, nine. So this is kind of almost like a unit situation, right? In a unit, you are not just taking the output of the encoder and then using that to do your decoding, but you're also taking intermediate results from the encoder and then also feeding that in, kind of like a, a skip connection or residual connection kind of idea. 
So they're doing the same thing here. They're, they're taking uh, the outputs from these intermediate layers and then also using that in the decoder. Uh, interesting to see that iBot features outperform the ones with OpenAI Clip. Our model with the DPT matches or exceeds the performance of recent work. Okay, qualitative. We show some qualitative results from our data set, our dense prediction evaluations. The linear segmentation produces good results and behaves much better under this evaluation setup. The qualitative results on depth estimation clearly illustrate the quantitative gap between OpenAI Clip and DynoV2. Much smoother depth estimation. All right, let's actually see these pictures. Okay, so we got Clip. But this is the input image, this is the clip, this is the Dino V2. Uh, and you can see here how clip has all this weird like artifacts here, but Dino V2 seems to be a lot cleaner. This is the image, this is uh, Dino V2, and then this is clip. The Dino V2 seems better. This is the depth estimation. So again, things that are purple are very are far away from the camera, and then things that are kind of this like light yellow orange color are supposed to be closer to the camera. So you can see here how the uh, the clip model or the the model trained using the clip feature encoder that is also frozen has this kind of like noise, the snow as it's sometimes called. The uh, uh, Dino V2 much much cleaner, much more smooth here. Yeah, kind of significantly better. Out of distribution example. So out of distribution just means that there's some distribution of images within your data set and there's some distribution of images that your model has been trained on. Out of distribution means there's it's an image that's outside of that distribution. It's an image that's weird. It's like unusual in some weird way. So what does that mean? That means like a drawing, right? So a drawing of a room, this almost looks like a Van Gogh drawing, but like a drawing of a room is out of distribution for a data set where everything you trained it on was real pictures of rooms. And what they're showing you here is like, look at how their model, the, the model that they trained, with the Dino V2 frozen uh, feature encoder is actually still able to do monocular depth estimation and semantic segmentation on this out of distribution example relatively well. And here we have the same kind of thing. It's like a painting, right? This is like oil painting, completely different kind of textures and, and, and patterns here than an image, but you can still get a pretty good depth image. And, and this is a little bit more, not as good, but still pretty good. And this is a very complicated image too. You have like people laying on top of other people and still gets it. Uh, we show a few examples of applying the depth prediction and segmentation linear classifier to out of distribution examples in figure eight. The qualitative results support our claim that our features transfer between domains. The quality of the depth and segmentation predictor for pictures of animals or paintings is very good, even though the domains are very different. PCA of patch features. Okay, so now they're gonna be doing principal component analysis, not on the, uh, on the final maybe features, but the features at the patch level, right? So like deeper in the vision transformer, looking at what's actually being done at the individual patches of these. Uh, we show that the results of the principal component analysis performed on each on the patch features extracted. We keep only the patches with positive value after we threshold the first component. This procedure turns out to separate the image's main object from the background. Okay, so basically you're getting, this is like emergent, right? It's emergent that the model learns to separate the background and the foreground, right? I'm not sure that those data sets are actually out of distribution because that sketch is also present in high frequency of natural images. 
Should be a better test on image modality like ultrasound. Yeah, I agree. I think I agree with you that you can call these out of distribution, but like there's degrees of out of distribution, right? Like this this painting of people is probably right here. If you have your your data distribution is probably right here versus like the x-ray image. Like imagine if someone took an x-ray of a rock underwater, right? Like the x-ray of the rock underwater is going to be like here. It's like way out of distribution. So I agree with you that a better example of out of distribution images would be like x-rays or like sonar or like some kind of weird image modality that doesn't look anything like a natural image versus like these oil paintings uh, sketches are not as out of distribution as they could be. So I agree with you there. Uh, okay, back to this. We compute a second PCA on the remaining patches across the three images depicting the same category. We color the first the three first components with three different colors and represents the results. Yeah, so this is the images we saw at the beginning. Again, kind of super interesting that there's this kind of emergent uh, behavior of separating the foreground and the background. Of course, it kind of makes sense that it would be, it would do that because of its, but more visualization. We compute the PCA between the patches. Each component corresponds to a different color channel. So three components, right, PCA. You can separate your data into any number of dimensions, but usually it's separated into three components for visualization purposes, right? And here they're separating into R, G, and B. So R represents uh, the first component, G probably the second component, blue probably the third component. And what they're showing you here is that the components for different images end up having kind of similar semantic meanings, how like you see how the blue tends to represent the legs of these animals, right? The green tends to represent the head of the animal, right? So not only is it have this emergent ability to separate foreground and background, but it also has this emergent ability to separate the head of something with the uh, legs of something and the body of something. So it's like, it's kind of learning the underlying kind of patterns of our reality emergently, which is pretty cool. Each component corresponds to a specific color. Uh, delineating the boundary of the main object. The second, other components correspond to parts of objects and match as well for images of the same category. This is an emerging property. Our model was not trained to parse part of the objects, right? Foundation models have emergent intelligence. We explore what type of information our patch level features contain by matching them across images. We start by detecting the foreground using the procedure described above. Then we compute the Euclidean distance between patch features. So I wonder why they're doing this, right? Why not cosine similarity between patch features? Why Euclidean distance? Then we apply uh, a non-maximum suppression to keep only the salient ones. We observe that the features seem to capture information about semantic regions that serve similar purposes. For instance, the wing of a plane matches the wing of a bird. We also observe that the model is robust to style and large variation of poses. Yeah, this is the most impressive to me, like this, this, this overhead like satellite. It's not a satellite image, this is like a drone shot, but like, this is fucking crazy. The fact that it can recognize that all of these are horses and that all these horses have heads and all the heads in this horse are more similar to this head here. Like what? <laughs> That's fucking crazy. All right, and you wouldn't have a big corporation paper without a fairness and bias analysis. So kind of there's a lot of political pressure on these companies to uh, kind of do these kind of fairness and bias uh, determinations, right? Usually this boils down to like, is everyone in your data set white or not? Like is every single image from the U S or do you have images from other countries as well? Right? So I think it's like, this is a little bit not necessarily doing anything to improve the actual performance of the model. Sometimes I feel like these actually, these fairness and things like that sometimes make the model actually worse, but 
I don't know. Whatever. Matching across images. We match patch level features between images from different domains, poses, and objects. So this is, right, the VIT 16 maybe has 16 patches, and then you can look at the what each of the patches corresponds to between these two different images. So you can see how the eye of the elephant matches the eye, the head, and the ear, and the ear, the legs, and the legs, and so on. This is quite crazy, the fact that it's able to match this, uh, I think it's Ganesh, right? This, this god, the elephant god, Ganesh, and then the uh, elephant here. Cardboard car with the, car with the bus. Gender, skin tones, and age. Blah, blah, blah. Fairness across gender and skin tone. It's going to perform slightly better on females than males. It's weird. And it's going to perform slightly better on 45 to 70 year olds than on old people. Turns out the model is racist against old people. Look at that. 88% versus 93. Got to shut it down. Gotta shut it down. We can't have old people not being segmented properly. Estimating the environmental impact. Okay, Another thing that people kind of uh, talk about in these papers and now these big companies have is kind of this like environmental impact. So like, oh, we train for X amount of time and like it uses up this much, uh, can this much carbon and it's like, this just seems like such nonsense to me like to be honest like the environmental impact of like a building is worse right like people make rolexes and fancy cars and think about how much carbon is used up to hold a un convention where they make this giant building and everybody shows up and everybody goes to davos in their airplanes and in their jets and they take their private jets to davos and here we are being like oh training these models is is bad because we have too much we're using carbon to train these models. It's like, dude, these models are the future. Like we're gonna help so many people with these models. And you're gonna try to prevent people from training models because the carbon footprint of the GPUs is too high. Like there's so many other things that are way more useless than this and that people have no problem doing, right? Like single use plastic. Single use plastic is so much worse for the environment than training ImageNet 1K on GPUs like we need we need perspective here, right? It's like I don't think climate change is impacted by deep learning and training these models I think let's get rid of single-use plastic. Let's get rid of pollution. Let's get rid of private jets like there's so many other things that are much better targets for climate change discussions than training uh, large models Okay, future work and discussion. Uh, in this work, we present Dino V2, a, a new series of image encoders pre-trained on large curated data with no supervision. This is the first self-supervised learning work on image data that leads to visual features that close the performance gap with weakly supervised alternatives across a wide range of benchmarks and without the need for fine tuning. <laughs> Ageism, cancel it, whole era. For me, it's more of a let us use and research this rather than protect the environment. Yeah, I mean, Gustavo, you're onto something, right? Sometimes, like for example, this is very prevalent in the uh, biomedical space, right? In the biomedical space, in order to release a new biomedical device or in order to release a new drug or anything like that, you need to go through so many different uh, regulatory kind of like tests and, and things and processes that it's basically, it takes millions of dollars to even have that, which means it's impossible to compete with large companies in the biomedical space because they just have so much more money that they can do that. So I could see a similar thing happening in the AI space, right? Where it's like, you're not allowed to train an AI system unless you can calculate the carbon footprint of your AI training, right? And if you're just some researcher at an academic institution, you don't, you don't have the time to calculate the carbon footprint of your AI training. So therefore you're not allowed to train the AI system, which means that over time, all of the AI is being done by these big companies that can do all of the regulatory uh, hoops that are required to do it. So 
yeah, sometimes it's a little bit it's kind of it, it's 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 sinister, right? It's like it's like sinister because all this like fairness and like uh, environmental impact studies, like if those become requirements, then it will become very difficult for anybody that doesn't have the same budget as OpenAI and as Meta and as Google in order to train these. Yeah, it's it's like a it is kind of fucked up in that way. Uh, a few properties that emerge understanding of object parts and scene geometry. We expect that more of these properties will emerge at a larger scales of model and data akin to instructions, emergence in large language models and plan to continue scaling along these axes. This paper also demonstrates that these visual features are compatible with classifiers as simple as linear layers, meaning the underlying information is readily available. Yeah, they release an open source version. I mean, I think that to me, I'm 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 actually like I'm much more bullish on Meta AI. I know like Meta and and Facebook AI research, they have a lot of kind of negative association because of just Facebook is kind of creepy, you know, and like the social media is a little bit creepy, but I don't know, in the past six months, like it seems like Facebook is not afraid to release their models and they go here and they tell you exactly what they're doing. They tell you what they're training on. They tell you how they're training. They tell you all the different tricks. And I like that, you know, I like that. I like being able to read a paper and understand and, and like know what is going on behind this foundational model. And I feel like OpenAI, which used to be the company that called itself OpenAI, that was all about open sourcing, they're the ones that are secretive now, right? Like. I don't know how the fuck they trained GPT-4. I don't know how they're training GPT-5. I don't know what data set they're using. I don't know how they curated that data set. I don't know the tricks that they use. I don't know if they're doing data parallelism, model parallelism. I don't know which of these different uh, techniques they're using, the distillation techniques, warm-up techniques. Like, So I don't know. I'm. It's weird for me to say this, but I actually trust Facebook now more than I trust OpenAI, which is fucking weird. But I guess that's just the way the universe works. And... I do have a hard out. I have to go to a meeting soon, but pretty cool paper. I think that to me, this they they definitely demonstrated that this this model is general, and that you can use these pre-trained vision and pre-trained feature encoders for a variety of tasks, and you don't have to fine tune them. You can basically just use them frozen. You can use them as is. So I don't know. I feel like this this is powerful. I can't wait to kind of see what people do with these and to see how the community improves. Um, but yeah, cool paper. I agree. Uh, hope you guys found that useful. If you guys have other work, other papers, other GitHub repos that, you, that you're interested in, in me kind of trying out and exploring, definitely let me know. Uh, if not, like and subscribe and hope you guys have a good Wednesday. Peace out.